Okay, today we're looking at the step two of the manifestation process, calm expectation. And I would just like to address um, some of the ideas that someone shared with me, and I always appreciate input about uh, what I'm talking about or some ideas that maybe you would like me to talk about or address. But uh, what was shared is the idea that <clears throat> I have made lists, I have written things down, and they didn't work out. Or they worked out in a way that I was not expecting or a way that was better than uh, what I was hoping for. <clears throat> and this uh, always is a, is a question with me because I don't believe in technique. I think sometimes the technique can help us uh, focus on our uh, whatever it is we would like to see manifest in our life. But it's not magic. It is natural. And that was one of the things uh, with the movie The Secret. How many of you saw The Secret? It was a very popular um, presentation, very well done. And I watched it with, with great interest. The longer I watched it, I watched it several times, uh, the more skeptical I became about it. Oprah made a big deal out of it and uh, was going to have a second program devoted to it and canceled the program because she said there was so many complaints about it being uh, illegitimate. An illegitimate, um, uh, I can't think how she said, raised too many hopes in a false kind of way. So what I would say to that is maybe that's true to some point. Um, that particular production had a way of making you think, if I just think of a Ferrari, you know, it'll show up in my driveway. And um, I guess I never really wanted a Ferrari or the maintenance involved in it. Because if, if you ask for a Ferrari, be sure to get the maintenance program that goes with it. Because if you don't put that down, you're going to be in serious trouble. But um, so it gave that impression. And it's, uh, you know, it was, as you look at it, it's very materially oriented. So the problem I have is, well, we have this body. And we have problems that we want to solve for this body. And we say the mind has something to do with the quality of our experience. So how do we connect these two things? And so we come up with these techniques that, uh, that help us do that. And I was just thinking about that this morning in a, in a little bit different sense. Uh, Deanne is a bird lover. She feeds birds. If you want to draw sparrows and starlings, you would put out anything you know, table scraps, and you'll draw. But say you want to draw the goldfinch. You would hang a bag of thistle. That's a specific thing you would do to draw a specific, to get a specific result. So what is different about that? Do you want starlings and sparrows in your life, or would you like a couple of goldfinches once in a while? And how do you attract those? And why do some people attract them and others just attract starlings and sparrows? So we want to make that connection somehow. And there's no silver bullet, I don't think. There's no magic way of doing that. With birds, it, there is kind of, because people do studies on this, we know what they like to eat, we know their habits, and we can actually create an environment that will draw specific kinds of birds. But if you say, I want to draw a kingfisher from Australia and they love sardines or whatever you, know. you could put sardines in your backyard till you're blue in the face and you'll never draw a kingfisher from Australia well if you, you could if you watch the secret enough times maybe you will <laughs> because one will be flying through and just happen to see your sardine and land and you'll say to everybody I you know that's what happened that's the kind of thing that happens and what I I found in, through my 40 some years of this that a lot of people in the business of, of convincing you that you know your vision is is the key and it is see that's the, the problem it is 
but not always in the way that's being presented. It's almost like a sales job. There's very high powered, positive thinking instructors that, and I think I even said in one of my books that when they come to your church or come to your group and make a presentation, they're the ones that leave with all the money, not you. <laughs> that's generally how it works. And then you go about your life trying to do what they told you and maybe some of the things work well and some don't. But that still does not get us past the idea that why does life manifest the way it does? Why do we have the particular kind of experience that we have? Is it just random? Does that goldfinch just happen to show up in our yard? Or do those sparrows and starlings just happen to show up in our yard? We have a mulberry tree, which I do not like. I would lo love to turn it into firewood, but it's kind of on our neighbor's property as well, so I can't do that. It's a beautiful tree, except when it does what it does, produce mulberries. It's a mess, and it just drops all over everything. And then these robins, and I love robins, but they stuff themselves with these mulberries, and they fly right over your window and they drop these humongous bombs, you know, right? And I don't know how they know, they know how to hit your window. But we opened the shade this morning in a bedroom window. There's two this big, you know, and like, how do they do that and why? <laughs> There's so many other targets on this planet, you know, but, but anyway, that's just one of the things. I would like to get rid of that tree for what it draws to us. Uh, we had a uh, an apricot tree back there, and uh, apricots it just produced millions of apricots, apricots. Ap I don't know how you say it. But after the first season, I cut it down because it was such a mess. It's like walking through apricot preserves, you know, when you go outside. <laughs> and I don't like doing that. We I grew up with a persimmon tree, and same thing. You know, persimmons are just they're a mess. It was right over hung right over our car. We had no drive, no uh, garage. And so we had to park the car away from the persimmon tree because there's such a mess. But anyway, that's kind of what I'm saying here is if you, if you have a mulberry tree, you'll attract all kinds of birds and the consequences of your birds that eat mulberries. And it's always purple, you know, these big. <laughs> so this, uh, this happens. It's not an accident. It's not a mistake. It happens because, you know, I'm feeding a feral cat. But I also discovered I'm drawing a raccoon. Um, and I look up what do raccoons love to eat and the top of the list, cat food. So the good news is the raccoon is nocturnal. So I've been putting the cat food away at night, feeding the cat in the day. Probably shouldn't be feeding the cat anyway, but I think is a very pretty little cat. It doesn't like me at all, so it's a distance, long distance relationship. But um, so you put something out, you'll draw something. You know, it doesn't, it's not rocket science. Uh, you'll get certain consequences, certain results. And so we as truth students, as spiritual students of spiritual principle, want to know how do we make this physical life better? What can we do? to draw into our life something that is more desirable and maybe what are we doing that's drawing things that we don't necessarily like? And can we change that? And to me that is the whole point of an exercise like this. It's like understanding, you know, what am I thinking all day long? Why am I getting sparrows and starlings? It's because I'm putting out table scraps. My thinking is table scraps. It is not always good. You know, it's not always um, uh, my expectations are not always high, so I'm putting out something that maybe if I change that, and how do I change that? I begin by defining what I would like to see. And as I have always said, you, you attach to that goal or desire this or something better, which means I'm flexible. You know, I would love to draw goldfinches, but I'll take a bluebird or I'll take, you know, whatever might flutter in. It's this or something better or something more than I'm expecting. It's not locking in. I think the moment we lock into, we've got to have that Ferrari in our driveway and it doesn't show up. 
then we say this is a this is a sham. You know, it doesn't work. And the very moment we're saying that it's working, because we're thinking something. We are lowering our expectations, changing them, doing something that somehow our life keeps happening to us and only to us, nobody else, in the specific way it does, why? That's what we want to know. And so we apply a technique that will help us kind of get a handle on what we're doing. And by the way, that's my, our cat, Sadie, and she is always in calm expectation. I was, we were talking this morning about intelligence of animals we started with pigs but i said the cat i believe has it figured out do you ever say to your cat roll over and i'll give you a treat do a backflip or speak <laughs> the cat would just look at you and say really you know like i'm not doing that <laughs> you're going to feed me anyway so you talk about calm expectation and they look at you and they kind of squint their eyes, you know, and just, that's calm expectation. That's why we love cats, I think, because we would like to be just like they are. <laughs> they just kind of move along and do whatever. But the first step is to form a clear picture of your desire with the understanding that by doing, by so doing, you impress your desire upon the creative life force. This understanding takes the first step out of the region of fantasy. And I think this might be where people could have a problem is the moment you write something down. Well, what do you write down? Do you write down a Ferrari? Well, maybe you would. Maybe you would like to sell your house. Maybe you would like to move into another neighborhood. Maybe you would like to get a car. We have all kinds of those types of desires. And when our focus is just there, this is pretty much a hit and miss proposition. So what are we talking about desire? We're talking about quality of life. That's why we say this or something better. If Ferrari would make your life better, you know, be open to that. I don't know how it would exactly, because most of us are beyond the age of having to impress anybody of the opposite sex. So Ferrari would not come in too handy for people like me. I have a three wheel bicycle. And that uh, gets a lot enough attention for me, you know, as we drive by people, they say, what is that thing? But it's a, uh, that's a tricycle, I guess it is. If we are only in the realm of things, then we're going to have problems. We're going to encounter problems. Whenever I want a particular thing, it's because I want to improve something about my life. And that generally is connected to something about the way I feel about my life, about myself. And I'll think this, publishing this book or you know, having something brought into my life will help. But you say this or something better, it means I'm not locking my whole level of expectation on this thing. I'm looking for a, a lifting of my quality of life. And you see, the reason that's important to say is because if you write down a thing, you make a list of a thing. I want to get married. I want to get divorced. I want to, you know, some particular thing that will make you happy forever. I've shared the story. In fact, it was in one of my books about the woman who had been through a horrific divorce. And so she worked on herself for a number of years to become the perfect, you know, to set up the perfect mindset to draw the perfect guy. And she did. Eventually, she got the perfect guy. I think it was, took seven years. But it took about seven days to figure out he wasn't the perfect guy. <laughs> and so she was angry. Like, why, why did I do this? Why did God let me do this, manifest this situation, this guy? Uh, maybe it's because the guy isn't going to make you happy. Do you know any guys that can make you happy? Any women that can make you happy? I don't know of any other person that can make me happy. Maybe if, you, if your goal is to be happy rather than get a guy, you might have better luck. Because what if you were happy without the guy? What if you were happy without that perfect marriage? What if you learned the secret 
of showing up in your daily life and enjoying that. So you'd say, okay, the perfect guy would be great, a marriage would be great, but this or something better. What does that represent? I have pointed out that sometimes the things we desire are ways of protecting a weakness rather than advancing a strength. We don't want to deal with a certain weakness that we have, so we want a certain thing to happen so we don't have to deal with it. We like to make a whole bunch of money so we don't have to change all my bad habits. I can do whatever I want. It's like wanting something material so I don't have to look at myself to look at the problem that I'm, that I'm uh, experiencing. So we're trying to protect a weakness rather than advance a strength. I think that's a lot of what we see in the whole goal setting uh, arena is people that are trying to get ahead in life, they're trying to succeed thinking that their success will make them happy when we discover that success doesn't always make us happy. And by success, I mean attaining a certain objective. It doesn't always make us happy. We can be just as miserable. That was Emerson's whole point that he said, you know, I wake up wanting to, to go to Naples where I'll be happy and fulfilled. And lo and behold, I wake up in Naples and I've carried with me the same sad self that I left. You know, and it's just, uh, I'm misquoting what he said, but that's the idea. That wherever we go, whatever we achieve, we take ourselves with us. So when we're setting goals, we've got to keep that in mind. What would this thing do? How would I feel if this happened? That's the question that we raised last week. How would I feel? You know, to ask that question and answer it, you're actually becoming the answer. You're actually allowing yourself to become the answer you're seeking. I want that thing so, so I can feel this way. Well, you're demonstrating to yourself that you can feel this way without that thing. But see, that gets into, well, is materialism wrong then? And we have to say, no, we don't want to go down that road either. We want to render unto Caesar that which is Caesar and unto God that which is God's. We live in two worlds. One is the body, one is the spirit, the soul. And you can't ignore either one of them. We often uh, ignore the spiritual side, focusing totally on the body. And that's where our whole realm of, if I get this or that, you know, I'll be happy. But you, your soul is always sitting in the background saying, you've got everything you need right here. You don't need another material thing. That comes and goes. And it's saying, open yourself. That's what the kingdom of God is all about, in, in my opinion. That's what Jesus was talking about. Open yourself to this deeper reality because that's the source. That's your strength. You will not be seeking to compensate for a weakness or protect a weakness if you evolve the strength of the soul. So that's step one. I better get on step two. Beth said I had a long prayer this morning. So know that you are working with law. With calm expectation of, your corresponding, of a corresponding result, you know that all necessary conditions will come about in proper order. I've shared with you before that I started out thinking I wanted to be a professional musician. Well, that didn't work out. And I'm glad it didn't. Uh, back in that, those days when I was thinking that, I was coming from a different place than I ultimately uh, started coming from. And what I thought I wanted, I did want from that level. I did want being that person, that's what I wanted. Thinking it would be a, a provide some level of fulfillment. But it turns out that's not the, you say this or something better, there was something better. And there was a time in my life when I was so frustrated with trying to succeed in music, I just laid everything down and just stopped trying and started turning within and started reading more and paying closer attention to what it was that I really was feeling at that time. And I started thinking more about 
this whole spiritual thing, you know, it got my attention right off the bat. I decided to take a month of classes at Unity Village, and moved, moved there, lived there for a month, which gave me a, a wonderful opportunity to do a lot of self-reflection. And that's where the transition was made in my life. I dropped the whole musical thing as a, as a career, as a desire, desired career, and said this spiritual thing is what I want to do. This is what I want to get involved in because I think it's the thing I can help the most people with in the most uh, important kind of way. So this or something better, that's a, I've always lived with that idea. I think Catherine Ponder is the one that really focuses on it, and she's all about getting rich and all that stuff, but she's uh, got some really good ideas also that help us. But we've got to keep this in perspective. So know that you're working with law by defining in writing what you want. See, that's why I like to write books. That's why I like to write, write articles and so forth, because they help me understand what I believe. They help me get in touch. That process helps me get in touch with what I believe. If I can't write it out and put it in a sentence and a paragraph and several paragraphs and several pages and chapters and so on, then I probably don't understand what I'm talking about. That helps me create a mental emotional roadmap to put on paper, to put on the computer, what it is I think about something. And the, I'm working on a book now, in a sense, it's I'm doing it in a different way altogether. I'm just letting my mind do kind of a, a free flow with different subjects, and I'll bounce all around, and maybe it'll become a book, I don't know yet. But it is a very healthy thing to be able to do. What do you think about the reason that you incarnated, for example? I'll take a subject like that, and I'll write about that, and what I think about that. What, what, what does that mean? And what that helps me do is solidify my thinking in a particular direction. And that solidification may cause me to say, I still don't know, but I'm thinking about it. You walk down the street and talk to anybody. Why do you think you incarnated? Do you think they even think about it? You know, people don't even think about this stuff generally. It's just not something that's, but I'm very interested in it. I'm very interested in why I may have done that. And it certainly wasn't to save the world because I haven't done that yet. And I don't have much time left, so. But <clears throat> step two is know that you're working with law. And that's, that's the important thing. This is not just random, uh, what we're doing. I've said many times that we can better understand or exchange the word faith with the word expectation. You have faith in God, well, what do you expect? You know, you, we can all say, I have faith in God, but look at your level of expectation. When you're involved in some situation, yes, I have faith that there is a God, that God's working on my behalf and all, but what am I expecting? See, that's where the activity is. And that's what we have to look at. That's why we make lists. That's why we write things down. Because when you start writing things down, you start getting in touch with where your expectation level is. That's what's helpful to me. Is yes, here's what I'm saying, but here's what I'm expecting. And that's a big difference. And when it is a big difference, we want to close that gap. And that's the whole point of an exercise like this. When you say, I have faith in God, you may not put yourself in the same assured mindset is when you say, I'm working with divine law, therefore I expect results. If you say you have faith in God, you may be saying you have faith that God will do good things for you. But what do you expect? You know, that's the important thing to ask, I think, the question to ask. When you think of yourself as working with law, you step out of the imposed, perceived personality of God and enter the realm of cause and effect. Your desire becomes a cause, and its manifestation is the effect. The attitude of calm expectation becomes a magnetic atmosphere of developing possibilities. So your desire becomes a cause. What is your desire? That's the most important question to ask yourself. It's not the Ferrari. What's that Ferrari going to give you? What's it going to enable you to do? How's it going to make you feel? That's your goal. You know, it's like Emerson going to Naples. 
What's the goal? It's for me to feel better. Well, I wonder if I could do that at home. Maybe I wouldn't have to spend the money and go to Naples, only to come to this stark realization that I took my sad self with me. That's what we want to do. What is our true desire? And uh, when, the more you write down, the more you be, you're able to bring that to the table, bring it to the surface. Your clear desire becomes a cause. If your cause is blurry, the effects that follow will be blurred as well. If you've clarified it, you can enter this second step of calm expectation with the assurance that you have set into motion a cause that will produce a specific effect. So I can say, I want to draw um, a certain kind of bird to my backyard. I can visualize that. I can see them landing out there. But if I'm putting out table scraps, you know, I'm going to get a certain result. And it's not going to be one that I really like. So I pick up a book. Backyard birds, you know, what, what do they look for? What do they want? How can I bring myself into alignment with that result? That's the question. And will bringing a bird into my life make me happy? No, it doesn't. I'm on a Facebook bird, Colorado bird site, and some of the people on there talk about, like, I saw this bird I've never seen in my life, and it's like the fulfillment of all my dreams, you know? <laughs> well, I'm not quite that bad, uh, because I know that that will not happen. It's a very exciting thing to see, in, in my opinion. And I know, Deanne, you understand what this is like. And there's a reason bird and nerd rhyme. But um, when you see something you've never seen before, and, you, and especially if you get a photograph of it, there's a feeling not anything like that. But it doesn't answer all the problems I have in my life. <laughs> I'll tell you that. So, but the clarity idea, by clarity, take your mind off the thing and what do you want the thing to give you. That's your goal. That's clarity. So that's a very important distinction to make. Each morning as you awaken, picture, picture your desire and give thanks that some aspect of it is working into your life this day. Do not be concerned if you see no evidence that this is happening. When you plant a seed, you never see immediate evidence of its growth, but you plant it with calm expectation that it's growing. So that's kind of interesting you know when i was going through this period of frustration where the music thing was just it was angering me almost that it, nothing was working kind of thing it's like okay i wouldn't get up in the morning and say i want that some uh, some new sign you know that that is the proper direction show me the next step the proper direction was me letting go that was a manifestation of that desire, not knowing what, what is in the future, but part of the answer is to totally let go and see no evidence of anything except freedom. I'm free to let go of this. I'm free to say this or something better. That's a huge statement, you know, when you're in actually on the battleground of manifestation. It's probably not a good way to say it. But it's when you're involved, it may be that the next step is for you to let go of something, something you thought was important. And so it can manifest. And just as you get up every day, something like this is going to happen. Something new is unfolding. That's the calm expectation of knowing that. Go about your daily life holding this expectant attitude always. At night when you go to bed, you make your picture vivid, giving thanks that it unfolds even as you sleep. Living with calm expectation keeps your heart open and joyful, and it truly does. That I don't know what's happening, I don't know how it's going to happen, I just know it is happening. Calm expectation, not trying to force anything. Does that make any sense? Okay, good. So we'll keep, pick this up next week, and uh, again, I have reservations about techniques and so you don't hear me talking about them a lot, but there's a place for them if we use them properly. All right? Thanks for coming out. Have a wonderful weekend.
have been watching a talk given by Reverend Doug Botworth here at Independent Unity in beautiful Grand Junction, Colorado. Thank you for watching. Please like and subscribe. It really helps us spread our message. If you would like to support us, you can do so by clicking the button in the right-hand corner of the video screen. We greatly appreciate your support. Thanks again for watching.